Supreme Court Justice Patrick Crooks was first elected to the state's highest bench in 1996. He was re-elected in 2006. He'll have to make a decision here pretty soon about whether to seek re-election. And he's joined us for uh, a, a newsmaker's interview. Thank you, Your Honor, for, for, for coming in. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me. I, I am, um, this was what, your 20th term on the, on the bench? Uh, it's my, I just finished my 19th just year. Just finished your 19th. Yep. I gave you one too many. I'm sorry. I'll That's take okay. <laughs> well, let me ask you, was this your most difficult term with all, all that went on, Your Honor? It just ended yesterday. It's, it's been a difficult term because of the, uh, the transitions that have occurred. Okay. In the Abramson lawsuit, which we'll discuss in a minute, in, in your May filing, you said you cited uncertainty and turmoil, turmoil on the court. Can you elaborate on that, please, Your Honor? Well, we ended up with a situation where we didn't have a procedure in place for electing uh, a chief justice after the uh, Government Accountability Board had certified mm -hmm. the election results. Right. And so things went in a rather chaotic fashion. Um, some people voted, uh, they voted by email. Um, I had tried to find out if there was some procedure that we might utilize from some other state that also elects their uh, chief justice. And um, I've got a friend on the Oregon Supreme Court. Uh, I went to him and said, what do you guys do? Uh, what's your procedure? <coughs> Excuse me. They basically said, we don't have any. It's an informal kind of a thing. Well, I had hoped that they'd give us some real guidance. They didn't. And I think the way things worked out, uh, it was chaotic. Um, it was chaotic in the sense we had no procedure in place. Um, Mike Gableman had made a motion, but it had never been voted on. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we started out with some real chaos, I thought. The Republican legislators who sponsored the constitutional amendment, um, and Wisconsin I covered the public hearings on that and the debate, of course, they insisted that this was not aimed at Chief, former Chief Justice Shirley Abramson. Was it aimed at her, Your Honor? I think by some people it was. Uh, by others, I think uh, there was a feeling that this was the right way to go in the long run. Um, there are 22 other states that elect their own uh, Chief Justice, that the justices elect the Chief Justice. And I, um, to be honest about it, I wasn't aiming this at, at Shirley. Uh, my feeling about it was in the long run, this court would be much better off if we elected our own chief, that people would be nicer to each other, mm. they would be more polite to each other, everybody would hope that in turn they would get their chance to be the chief. Yes. And that's the way it's worked in the other states that elect their own chief justice. So you actually, as one voter, voted for the constitutional change? I no, did. You did. For just those reasons. Yes. And then it was certified, and then came an email. Was the motion offered by email by Justice Gableman? Uh, actually, it was offered in conference. Uh, we never voted on it. And then uh, he repeated it, if I remember correctly, by email. Okay. And you weren't comfortable with this from a, from a pro procedural standpoint, Your Honor? I was not. I thought that. Uh, we should have agreed in advance of the procedure. Um, I would have preferred that we did our election of a new Chief Justice in public. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that the public uh, ought to be able to see the process. Uh, of course, that never happened. Um, we had some other complications <laughs> that caused uh, only four of the seven of us to vote. So there were only four, but that constituted the uh, enough to see Chief Justice Pat, Pat Rogan's act. Yes, it did. Do you, um, well, let me ask you this. Um, did former Chief Justice Abramson come to you and seek your advice on whether to file a federal court lawsuit, Your Honor? No, she did not. She did not. Had she come to you, would you have advised her, maybe you ought to re re rethink that? I think I would have suggested to her that she go very slowly in regard to whether or not to file an action. Um, I can understand why she did it. 
Um, I think that there are, um, as uh, Judge Peterson uh, suggested, some plausible arguments in her favor. Mm -hmm. But there's some public relations aspects to all of this and some transition uh, aspects that uh, would have caused me to suggest to her that she move very slowly. You mentioned the word transition. You also cited that in your May pleadings in, 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 in uh, Justice Abramson's lawsuit. What would have been a more transition, uh, what, what would have been a, uh, a, a transition plan, Your Honor? Well, there were a number of things that had been talked about. Uh, just as an example, uh, Justice David Prosser had suggested that there be no change uh, to another Chief Justice until about the 1st of August when the new term uh, technically would start. Yes. Um, there were others that suggested at least we ought to finish this term which uh, ended uh, actually yesterday. Yesterday, June 30th. That's right. And um, I, th I think if all of us had agreed on a starting date, if all of us had agreed on a procedure to elect the new Chief Justice, um, things would have been much smoother. So, you, uh, I just want to be clear. You and Justice Ann An Walsh Bradley and Justice Shirley Abramson has, have never voted officially on the motion to seat uh, uh, Chief Justice Rogan's act as, as the chief, Your Honor? That's correct. That's okay. Um, well, talk about, how would you characterize your relationship with, with the current Chief Justice? Oh, I, I think it's a good one. Um, we've known each other a long time. If we go, go back far enough, uh, Pat Rogensack and I and Ann Bradley and a couple others were all running uh, at the same time in 1995 for the court. So I've known Pat Rogensack uh, since that time. Um, when she ran for the uh, Court of Appeals, uh, I supported her. Um, and uh, I actually uh, asked some supporters of mine to, uh, to get in line to be helpful for her. Um, I think over the years we've had a pretty decent relationship. You followed all the pleadings in, in, in her federal lawsuit. Um, you've read them all and you've submitted your own brief. Do you think Chief, Ju Chief Justice, is there a question in your mind whether Chief Justice Rogan's Act is legally the Chief Justice right now or has that been resolved, sir? No, it really has not been resolved. Um, judge Peterson, uh, who is a uh, district court judge uh, in the Western District of Wisconsin here in Madison, has that case in front of him. He's indicated he hoped he would make a ruling by the 1st of August. It would not surprise me if uh, whatever he did was appealed to the Seventh Circuit uh, in Chicago. Um, there have been some procedural things that have been already appealed to the Seventh Circuit. So I think it's still very much in flux. Well, but he has also declined to issue, he has refused to enjoin um, and hold the process in abeyance while he issues the final ruling. So in essence, he's more or less gone along with uh, Chief Justice Rogan's act as the chief. Uh, correct ruling? Is that a correct interpretation? Yes, it is a correct interpretation. I think what he said is that um, he didn't want to interfere with the process uh, in the meantime. <coughs> Excuse me. I had hoped that he might use um, what I called his equitable powers to uh, set forth a transition plan. Uh, this is way back in the beginning when all of this was occurring. Mm -hmm. And I had hoped that he would do that to sort of ease the kind of uh, what I saw as chaos that was uh, existing initially. Um, he refused to do that, and I can understand that too. He felt that uh, we should uh, work it out ourselves, if you will. Was there still chaos when the court adjourned its term yesterday, sir? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. Um, did you hold yourself out or hope at some point to be the interim chief justice while this matter was resolved? Yes, I for, did. For, and and w would that have been for a year or two or uh, well, your potential term is up next next year? It, it would have been um, 
for a period of time where I felt I could uh, help both sides. Um, I've always been sort of, uh, uh, over the last several years, a bridge between both sides on our court. And uh, the reason that I, uh, I did that was because I thought that I might be a peacemaker, that I might be able to uh, resolve things by being able to go back and forth and talk to both sides, mm -hmm. as I've always been able to do. Had you been Chief Justice, how would you try to be a peacemaker or try to get a more collegial court? which you must admit it's been pretty tough. It, it's been non-collegial in some of the recent years, Your Honor. So what steps would you have taken to try to bring people together? Well, it, uh, let me start out this way, if I might. I think we have a very talented court. Um, I think that uh, we're very fortunate, uh, despite some of the uh, publicity to the contrary, in that we have seven people who are bright, who are hardworking, who care about doing a good job. And I would have tried to utilize uh, those talents and abilities. Um, I'd f just to give you some examples, Steve, um, one of the problems we've had is uh, in regard to a perception out there that our court is uh, uh, not nonpartisan. Uh, that our court is not independent. Um, and I would have tried to uh, urge my colleagues uh, whenever they had a chance to speak, whenever they had a chance to uh, meet with members of the public, to emphasize uh, that we do have um, a nonpartisan court, an independent court, a court that uh, makes decisions based on the law. Um, I think that would have been helpful. One of the other problems, and I, I don't know if you've had the uh, chance to read the uh, long article in the New Yorker magazine about our court. I have not. Um, it was uh, entitled, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, something along the lines of the destruction of the Wisconsin Supreme Court. And one of the things that the article aimed at was the fact that we have uh, a problem with our recusal rules mm -hmm. and talked about the fact that that was sort of the beginning of the divisions on our court. Um, I would have tried to urge my fellow justices to do something about that. Um, we have a, <coughs> excuse me, we have a sort of a strange situation in that we have a subjective rule in regard to uh, the statutes, in regard to recusal. We have an objective rule in regard to our uh, judicial code. However, the results of violation of either the objective rule or the subjective rule are different. And we're out of line with 48 of the 50 states and the feds. Um, the, the federal government and 48 of the states have an objective rule. And um, that would be a step in the right direction for us, in my opinion, in terms of um, healing the perception that's out there in regard to our court and the divisions on our court. What is there about the personal and professional styles of both Chief Justice Rogan Zak and former Chief Justice Shirley Abramson that has had them at loggerheads often, Your Honor? They're both very strong personalities. Um, and, I, and I say this uh, recognizing that not everybody is right all of the time, but I think both of them uh, feel generally that they're right uh, when they take a position. And uh, oftentimes those positions are contrary one to the other. And so that has caused some uh, difficulties between the two of them, um, which is unfortunate because uh, if, you, if you pull back from the court and just talk about them as individuals, they're both nice people. Uh, they're both very bright. Uh, they both work hard. Uh, they both care about the court. Well, 
in hindsight, did former Chief Justice Shirley Abramson not share enough collectively in terms of powers? Was did she assume too much authority, Your Honor? And that's that, that's been a cause of the friction. Um, let me answer it this way: as any uh, person, she's evolved through the years as the Chief Justice. Um, when she first became the chief, uh, and this is just my view now, I think she was very unsure of herself. I think she, uh, she felt she had to uh, uh, grab her authority and stamp it clearly so that everybody saw that she was in charge. Mm -hmm. um, through the years, I thought that she had evolved um, and was much more uh, open with her discussions with the other members of the court um, and uh, had frankly become a much better Chief Justice than she was in the beginning. Okay, So she was sharing more power with other justices in recent years as compared to when she became Chief and I think it was 96, that's the year that you joined the bench? I, I think that's true and I think she was uh, sharing much more information as well with other members of the court. Well, look back over the last five years. When did you begin to sense, or was there one incident that you began to say, these personal disagreements are increasing and troubling? Uh, can you talk about how you watched that grow over the last five years, Your Honor? Well, I know that you're aware of the fact, and a lot of people are, that there was a physical altercation between um, Justice Ann Walsh Bradley and um, Justice David Prosser. Um, Justice Prosser has never uh, denied the fact that he ended up, however it occurred, uh, with his hands around Ann Bradley's neck. Mm -hmm. um, and other people who were there at the time uh, had different versions of what had occurred. That certainly added to um, the uh, difficulties with the court. Uh, you may or may not know, I was fortunate in that uh, I wasn't there. You were not there. Um, I had just gotten a new pair of contact lenses and the doctor had told me, don't wear them more than I think it was 10 hours. I had reached the 10 hours and I told everybody I'm going home. Mm -hmm. And so literally I was home when this happened which led to the filing of an ethics complaint, uh, complaint against Justice Prosser, which members of the court have stepped away from, which means it cannot be resolved. Um, what's your idea on how to resolve any complaint against any sitting Supreme Court justice if there's not enough fellow justices to decide the, ca uh, the complaint, Your Honor? Well, I think that, frankly, it would take probably a constitutional amendment to develop a, a procedure uh, in regard to that type of situation. There are only two of us that have said that we could sit um, and make a judgment or at least have not taken ourselves off of the uh, Bradley Prosser situation. I'm one of them because I wasn't there right. and I felt I could be fair to both sides. Um, Justice Abramson has not acted one way or the other. But as you know, um, you need more than two people yes. uh, to make a decision. Is it unfortunate that this complaint goes unresolved? And do you still think there's a professional cloud over Justice Prosser because it hasn't been resolved, Your Honor? I think it's unfortunate that it hasn't been resolved. Um, I think for Justice Prosser, it's been tough. Um, and for Justice uh, Ann Walsh Bradley as well, that this is still hanging out there after all of these years. Um, I don't know if the Judicial Commission ultimately will decide that they should dismiss the matter or uh, how they should dispose of it, but I think it is unfortunate that it's still there. When I watch the interplay between, <coughs> excuse me, the two of them, um, for instance, in the conference room, uh, they get along quite well. Um, a lot of years have gone by. The incident really, I think, has faded for both of them 
except it, it's lurking in the background. Well, under the constitutional amendment that you mentioned, would this allow other justices to come in and resolve complaints like this? Or would, uh, uh, would it allow other retired justices to come in and serve on the Supreme Court for a specific case? It, it could allow either. Um, certainly there's the possibility that the resolution um, might be uh, using Court of Appeals judges. Um, the resolution might be using former justices on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. But that would really be a call of the legislature initially and then ultimately the people in uh, amending the Constitution. Has, just, has Chief Justice Roganzak made some mistakes um, as uh, Chief Justice? Did I read in a news story that, and correct me if this is wrong, that sh you were quoted as saying she had threatened to take cases away from justices? If I'm off, if I'm far wrong, correct me, sir. Well, what, <coughs> excuse me again, what had occurred was that um, Chief Justice Rogensack scheduled some conferences, um, closed conferences, that were not on the court's calendar. We adopt the calendar a year in advance. And under our rules, uh, both our internal operating procedures and our uh, procedural rules, um, Basically, the understanding is that um, there will be no change of the calendar uh, without unanimous consent. Um, Chief Justice Rogensack had scheduled some of these closed conferences. She didn't have unanimous consent. And so th there was serious question as to whether or not it was appropriate to uh, move in that fashion. Um, and um, in one instance, uh, I think she had indicated that if uh, some of us didn't attend and didn't participate, that she would indicate to uh, others that we had withdrawn from participation. Um, she would have no power to do that. I think that was a mistake on her part. Um, I think she's learned from that mistake and uh, I think we've all moved on. You've been characterized at times as part of the moderate or liberal wing with Justices Ann Walsh Bradley and, just, and former Chief Justice Shirley. Is that a fair characterization, sir? It depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about a uh, judicial philosophy, uh, it's not a fair characterization. Um, I think that uh, anybody who has watched 19 years of decisions by myself would have to come to the conclusion that I'm a judicial conservative. Um, if you talk about politics, if you talk about are you a uh, political conservative, I don't think I am. I think I'm basically a moderate and I always have been. When uh, uh, I was uh, in private practice. Uh, I was active as a Republican. Um, however, I certainly was not a conservative Republican. I think I was a moderate. And so politically, I think I'm a moderate. Um, but judicially, I think I'm clearly a judicial conservative. What are your thoughts on how running for the Supreme Court has changed from your 1996 and 2006 races specifically the inf influence of third party groups that would spend millions to help or hurt specific candidates for the court, Your Honor? Well, it's, it's changed a lot. In 1996, when I was elected to the court, there were seven of us in a primary. Um, and it was a very collegial group, literally. We all got along well, we uh, discussed issues. Um, there was not a lot of money spent. Um, and uh, I was fortunate enough to come out first in the primary and then to uh, defeat a very good judge uh, who's recently uh, left us, recently died, Ralph Adam Fine, uh, in the general election. Um, we didn't have to spend a lot of money. There was, there, 
uh, some dollars that were there in terms of public financing. Uh, my, you're testing my recollection a little bit, but I think that Ralph uh, Fine and I split like $30,000. Yeah. Um, From it the wasn't, public financing grant. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it wasn't much. Um, and in uh, 2006, when I ran for re-election, uh, I was very, very fortunate. I had no opponent. Um, frankly, that's the last Supreme Court contested race where there's been no opponent. It wasn't a contested race. I was fortunate enough not to have opposition. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't have to spend any money other than I think we threw a, a pizza party at uh, uh, one of the uh, Madison establishments to celebrate the fact that we had no opposition. Um, but that's it. Uh, since then, there's been huge amounts of money. I know. It, it is, are you concerned about that trend, Your Honor? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Why? Because special interest groups, it's been said, um, this, isn't my, uh, this isn't my assertion, but you've heard it said that they're buying justice. Is that an overstatement, sir? When, when special interest groups spend one, two, three million? I think it's a legitimate concern. I really do. Um, if you've got an outside group spending, uh, as an example, two, three million dollars in support of a candidate, um, I think the public becomes um, somewhat cynical in terms of uh, how this is all going to uh, shake down. Are you going to owe that uh, outside group and, and the uh, positions of that outside group um, some real heed when you sit down to uh, vote on a case. Well, within the last two years, you've heard the debate in light of the huge spending. Let's not elect judges, let's appoint judges. Your position on that, Your Honor? Well, I went back um, and looked at uh, the debates that occurred when we adopted our Constitution in uh, 1848. And we had the same kind of discussion then, believe it or not, that uh, has occurred recently. Um, the uh, Constitutional Convention uh, opted for elected judges. And we've had that tradition in Wisconsin ever since. I think it would be extremely difficult to change that to an appointed uh, type of situation. I'll just tell you my own experience. I, uh, I had the experience several times of uh, being considered for the federal bench. Um, in at least two of those times, uh, I was clearly number one with the Judicial Selection Committee. Uh, I was not selected. And the reason I wasn't selected was because the decision ultimately is made based on politics. Um, and that's understandable. So anybody who thinks that an appointed system eliminates politics uh, from the process doesn't understand the way it really works. You've been a part of the institution and uh, a institution that you care deeply about for 19 years. What toll has the last five or six years taken on you personally, given the disagreements on the bench, Your Honor? Um, it's, it's taken a toll physically. Uh, it's taken a toll um, emotionally. Um, I, I think I started out earlier indicating that we've got very good people on the court. Uh, to be honest, I like all of them. Um, I consider all six of them to be my friends. And it's very difficult when you see friends not getting along mm -hmm. with each other. Mm -hmm. um, so it has been difficult for me and I, and I know that I should be uh, mature enough at this point to, uh, to handle the situation, but sometimes you come home in the evening and it's, uh, it's difficult. Um, I share with my wife, uh, it wasn't a good day <laughs> at the court. <laughs> Um, but I, I think we're heading in the right direction. I think that uh, uh, if we can get over the perceptions out there of, uh, 
uh, a partisan court, if we can get over the perceptions that we're not an independent court, if we can make some changes in regard to the recusal rules so that we end up uh, aligned with 48 of the 50 states and the, and the feds in terms of an, ob an objective standard, uh, I think we can uh, really make some progress for the future. Do you want to take advantage of this Wisconsin I interviewed to announce whether you're going to seek re-election, Your Honor? No, I'm not ready to do that. <laughs> what, are going to, what, what are going to be the factors in your decision, and when do you hope to make a decision, sir? Um, I'm hoping to make a decision, uh, certainly uh, uh, if not late summer, early in the fall. Okay. Um, and I'm going to consider how things are going at the court. Uh, I'm going to consider whether or not uh, I think that I have any uh, real use uh, on the court as a, uh, a peacemaker, uh, as a bridge between uh, uh, both sides. Um, I'm going to look at my physical health, my mental health, and certainly I'm going to look at uh, what my wife thinks I should do. <laughs> which is a very important consideration. Well, congratulations on attaining 77. Is age going to be a big factor, Your Honor? Um, it, it will in terms of uh, the physical side of it. I don't think it will be in terms of the mental side of it. I've, uh, if I felt I was losing it mentally, mm -hmm. uh, that I didn't have uh, uh, any uh, good judicial uh, uh, approaches to cases anymore, I'd get off quickly. Well, two have already announced for your job. Court of Appeals Judge Joanne Kloppenberg and Milwaukee County Circuit Court Judge uh, uh, Joseph Donald. And you and I have heard the talk about uh, Milwaukee County Judge, or is she now a Court of Appeals Judge? Rebecca Bradley? Yes, she is. She okay. was just sworn in on the just Court of Appeals. Just sworn in. That, that's the reason I didn't have it right. You've heard the talk about those three candidates. Does that concern you? Do you think if the conservative and business groups lined up be, uh, uh, behind Court of Appeals Judge Bradley and if the liberal moderates lined up behind Judge Kloppenberg, and I don't know uh, Judge, Judge Donald very well, that you wouldn't be able to raise enough money to compete with those others if they're backed by big spending third, third party groups, Your Honor? Independent well, group? I, I think you know the uh, the old theory that the incumbent starts with a real advantage uh, in terms of name identification, uh, in terms generally of ability to raise dollars, um, and uh, those would be factors that would certainly weigh in for me. I uh, I, I think all three of them, uh, from everything I know, and I don't know. Uh, Rebecca Bradley at all. Um, I have spent some time with Joe Donald. Um, he would be a, um, I think, a conservative, uh, judicially uh, conservative uh, addition to our court. Um, Joanne Kloppenberg, I think, would be uh, more on the liberal side in terms of uh, philosophy, judicial philosophy. Um, Joe Donald is an interesting candidate because uh, he was appointed by Tommy Thompson. Um, he served on the uh, Wisconsin bench in Milwaukee, the circuit bench, with distinction. Um, he's an African American, which would give some real diversity to our court. I think we've missed the uh, diversity that uh, we had with uh, Justice Lewis Butler. Mm -hmm. Um, and so each one of those three would have some, some real positives. I wouldn't be surprised if um, there would be others entering the race as well. So I realize if I'm really going to jump in and do this, I better make my decision and, uh, and get at it. As somebody that was unopposed in 2006, are you afraid of having to raise the amounts of money that is now the price of entry into a re-election bid, Your Honor? That would clearly be a factor. Are you comfortable raising money, uh, asking people to donate to your campaign? Well, Which? I think you know that uh, there's been a very recent decision.
by the United States Supreme Court uh, involving the uh, Florida Bar. Mm -hmm. And the rule in Florida was that the candidate uh, cannot ask personally Thank you for, for money. Me. You're right. Thank you. And um, that's the same rule we have in Wisconsin. Um, you can name a finance committee. You can ask the finance committee to go raise the dollars for you. But you yourself are, uh, are clearly not to be doing it directly. Okay. Um, and yet it's, it's sort of a mixed bag because you can be at your own fundraiser. Uh, you can thank people for uh, their donations. You can have your family members work with your finance committee to raise dollars. But the U.S. Supreme Court had some very interesting comments in that Florida Bar decision. Um, Chief Justice uh, Roberts wrote the decision and he started out very early on by saying the judges are not politicians. And he then quoted at length from a speech given by uh, John Marshall uh, back in 1830 talking about how judges have to be uh, independent, how they have to be basically people that uh, uh, the citizens will have faith in and that independence is extremely important. Um, I thought it was an excellent opinion and uh, Chief Justice Roberts was very concerned with corruption and not only actual corruption but the appearance of corruption in allowing uh, a candidate for judge to go out and ask for dollars. As you consider whether to seek re-election, have you identified a potential number that you think you'd have to raise? 800,000, a million, a million, and 1.5 million? Any number jump to mind, Your Honor? No. Okay. Um, I know that uh, Chief Justice Abramson, uh, who ran as the Chief Justice at the time, um, was certainly uh, uh, concerned with raising somewhere around a million dollars. Um, I have not looked at what Ann Bradley raised in this last election. Um, so I don't know how that fit. But my impression is she didn't raise nearly as much as uh, Shirley Abramson raised uh, in her last election. Well, we're almost out of time, so maybe a final question is, when the court term ended yesterday, do you think from a personal relationship and a collegiality standpoint the court had hit bottom and did you see signs that you were building back up in terms of collegiality and regaining the esteem that our court had 10, 20 years ago? So were you optimistic as the court adjourned its term yesterday or you still have major concerns, sir? No, I'm optimistic. I, uh, I think that uh, we finished our work before midnight um, we actually finished uh, somewhere in the range of 7.30, quarter to 8. Um, overall, um, it was a good last day on the court. Um, I think we're all adjusting to the changes. Um, and I would give everybody an A for patience yesterday. Okay. So uh, I think we're headed in the right direction. And that, your primary as you sort out whether to seek re-election, your chief criteria will be, can I be a, con a continued peacemaker? That, that'll be a major part of it, or whether or not I'm really needed uh, to fill that role. If, uh, if things are rolling along smoothly mm -hmm. um, and people are really getting along and emphasizing some of the things that I mentioned, like uh, uh, the independence of the court, the uh, nonpartisan nature of the court and looking at whether or not we should join the uh, 48 other states and the feds with an objective recusal standard. Mm -hmm. If things were heading in that direction, um, I would see uh, that I wasn't as needed as I, otherwise I might feel I was needed to, to do and to, to push uh, issues. Justice Pat Crooks, thank you so much for coming in the day after the term ends. Congratulations on 19 years on our bench, Your Honor. Well, thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you for your very good questions. Okay, thank you.